First, I think we should, uh, uh, we, I'm gonna intro Andy Weir, who I doubt needs an intro to you guys, but I'm gonna just tell you. Andy Weir is a software engineer who uh, came to wild success with The Martian, which is an amazing book and a brilliant movie. And he's got a new book, Artemis, that we're gonna talk all about tonight. And so let's welcome Andy Weir. Oh, oh, we got one on. Let's see. Test, test. Oh, there. We're, the we're... ONOFF button was in the <laughs> OFF position. <laughs> we're back. Um, so we're back. I do want to just explain who I am and why I'm here, just in case you guys are curious. My name is Sarah Enney. Uh, I'm also an author. My debut book comes out in February. It's called Tell Me Everything with Scholastic. Um, Say I it a little slower. Make sure they can hear it. It's, uh, it's called Tell Me Everything. Uh, uh, it's uh, with Scholastic. I'm excited about it. Uh, but I also run a podcast called First Draft, where I interview writers like Andy. And I'm, so I'm super excited to be able to pick your brain a little bit about space and other things. Sure. Um, so, so let's just dive right into it. I, I'm going to try not to ask questions that you've answered a hundred times, but just to establish for the crowd, I do want to get a kind of a brief rundown. Where did The Martian come from? How did it become not only a book, but a physical book that you hold in your hands? Yeah, that's weird. No one's ever asked me that. That's <laughs> um, well, um, it, basically, I'm a dork. I've always been a dork, and I've always been really into space stuff. I, I love space travel, human space flight, um, unmanned you know, probes, everything related to the space industry. And so one day, I, I'm a computer programmer by trade. That's what I did for 25 years. <clears throat> and one day I was like, sitting, well, not one day, a series of days, I was sitting at home designing a mission to Mars to put humans on Mars, like you do. And I was like... <laughs> Okay, so how do we get the people there? How do we get them back? How do we, you know, make sure that they don't die if one thing breaks? What's the backup system for this? What's the backup system for that? What if this breaks and this breaks at the same time? How do we make sure the crew doesn't have to abort or worse yet, die? And um, then the increasingly desperate things they would have to do to stay alive, I, I was like, this, this might make a good... Hello. That's fine. <laughs> I thought, well, this might make a good story. So I created an unfortunate protagonist and subjected him to all of them. So, um, so I worked on that, and it was just a thing I was doing. It was a labor of love. I had given up on being a writer. I wanted to be a writer all my life. Um, but like, so for instance, go back in time to like when I was 18 and going to go into college, picking my major. I, I wanted to be a writer, but I also really like having regular meals. So I, I became an engineer. <clears throat> and... Um, in my late 20s, early 30s, I came into a bunch of money because I got laid off from AOL at exactly the right time so that I could cash out my stock options before they destroyed themselves by merging with Time Warner. And um, so I ended up with a decent amount of money. I could go without working for a few years. And I'm like, I'm going to do it now. I'm going to go, I'm going to break into writing. So I wrote a book. Uh, that book was not The Martian. You've never heard of it. It wasn't published. It sucked. <laughs> But, uh, you know, I felt like, okay, well, that was fun, but, you know, now it's time to, you know, I gave it, I gave it a try, and now it's time to go back into computer programming, you know, to, you know, earn a buck. And this was not a sad Charlie Brown music, hang your head situation. I like programming computers. I'm good at it. I enjoy it. I like working on a team. I, I really enjoy engineering. So I went back into it. And then I started writing for pleasure, just uh, posting things onto my website, just like this, that, and the other thing. And one of the things I started posting were chapters of The Martian. It was a serial when I originally wrote it, which is why kind of every chapter sort of ends in a little bit of a cliffhanger, because it was written in serial format. And then, you know, I finished it. It took me three years because I kind of went at my own pace. I'm like, ah, I don't give a crap. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> when I was finally done, I was like, okay, I'm done. Yeah, we're good. And then I started getting email. I had about 3,000 regular readers, which sounds like a lot, but it took me like 10 years to build up that much of a mailing list. And I started getting email from people saying like, hey, I love The Martian, but I hate your website, uh, which is fair. My website is like just total ghetto. It's just like white background with left justified hyperlinks. <laughs> And then when you click on one text wall of story, I mean, it's like the Soviet tractor factory equivalent of a website, right? And so, you know, it was not a pleasant reading experience. And they said, like, so can you just make an e-reader version? And I'm like, okay. So I figured out how to do that. 
And I posted that in EPUB and a Mobi version on my website and said, there, now you can do that. And other people are like, hey, I'm not really technically savvy and I don't know how to download a thing from the internet and put it on my e-reader. Can you just post it to Amazon so I can read it that way? So I figured out how to do that and I posted it to Amazon, Kindle Direct Publishing. Uh, be they require you to charge at least 99 cents. You're not allowed to give it away for free. And so, you know, I set it up for 99 cents. They hang on to it for like 48 to 72 hours to have a human look at it just to make sure you're not posting a bunch of goat porn. And <laughs> Don't judge. And then, um, and then, because uh, oh, if it is goat porn, they want it categorized properly. Yes. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big category right now. Yeah, right. Um, so uh, anyway, so uh, uh, it went live, and then I'm like, okay, folks, you can either read it for free on my website, get the e-reader version for free from my website, or you can pay Amazon a buck to put it on your Kindle. And a lot of people paid the buck just because... People are lazy and they don't want to work out. I would have paid the bucks. Yeah, right. For sure. Yeah, and that's fine. And it started to get up into the top sellers, top sci-fi, top goat porn, top everything. <laughs> and then eventually, like that, got the attention of Crown Publishing, uh, which is part of Random House. And they said, like, I mean, I'm skipping a few intermediate steps, but basically they said, like, hey, we think this might sell well as a print book. And I said, okay, that's super. <laughs> and so I kind of backed into the publishing industry. I mean. Um, that basically I was approached by an agent who became my agent. Then we were approached by a publisher who became my publisher. We, I, we were approached by Fox, 20th Century Fox, for the film rights. So it's like I never pitched it anywhere. People came to me, which sounds like, oh, God, what a charmed existence. But I just want everybody to remember the 20 years of being a failed author that I did before The Martian. <laughs> so. Very important. Very important. <laughs> Sorry, I just spotted my editor in the crowd. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so you should definitely pitch him your, your ideas oh for books. Boy. He loves oh that. Boy. You just go right over there. He's running away now. Just, uh, yeah, yeah. You guys <laughs> um, can go over there right now. It's, it's fine. <laughs> Um, thank you for catching up. I feel like it's important to kind of know the backstory and how The Martian came about. Um, I'm not going to ask too much about the movie because actually there's tons of stuff online about you talking about the movie and also the movie is the movie and you are the author. So I want to talk about writing and also the new book. When we get to questions, all the questions will be I'm about sure. the movie, but that's fine. <laughs> we'll hear all about Matt Damon at the end of the show. Matt um, Damon. But I do... <laughs> Whose impersonation of Brett Kavanaugh this weekend was great. Um, yeah. He was, he was wonderful. Out. What? <laughs> he was wonderful. I was just in the bathroom yelling at myself in the mirror. Anyway, we're not here for that either. Um, I, I want to talk about what I loved about catching up with The Martian, because I read it when it came out, and then I kind of came back and was obviously researching for this conversation and realizing that due to science, science. some parts of the book aren't applicable anymore. Now listen, you. <laughs> yes, there are a few things. Well, first off, there are a few just straight up violations of, of reality in the book. A couple of places where I hand waved physics. Now, for the most part, it's very scientifically accurate, and I, I put a lot of effort into it. But like the storm at the beginning, uh, that threatens a spaceship and stuff, that couldn't happen. And I knew it at the time. Mars's atmosphere is less than 1% Earth's atmospheric density, so the pressure on Mars at the surface is less than 1% of Earth's pressure, which means the wind, while it does go like 150 kilometers an hour, it, the, the momentum behind it, the inertia, the force caused by the wind is like 1% of what 150 kilometer an hour wind on Earth would be. So actually a Martian storm would have a difficult time knocking over a piece of paper, really. <laughs> And so that was just pure fiction, and I made it up, and at the time, I'm like, ah, eh, nobody knows this. Nobody knows this. And then, of course, the Martian movie came out, and Neil deGrasse Tyson's all like, well, actually. <laughs> and so now everybody knows it. So I've, I've educated America about Mars's atmosphere. Uh, the other th kind of hand-wavy thing I did was I said that the canvas, the HAB canvas, the, the material that the HAB is made of, blocks radiation. People like NASA would kill for that technology. They would absolutely be happily murder you for some thin, flexible cloth that blocks 100% of galactic radiation. <laughs> that doesn't exist. Um, but there are things that have since happened that invalidated it. So first off, I, I said like, okay, you know, so in, in the story, Mark Watney 
decides to grow potatoes, and he's like, oh, I need a bunch of water to, to you know, have the soil be moist enough for, you know, potato plants to grow. And so he reduces hydrazine fuel from the lander. He needs to liberate the hydrogen, mix it with oxygen, which he got from the oxygenator, which he got from CO2 from Mars' atmosphere. Big complicated thing, kind of blows himself up a little bit during the process. Lots of danger, excitement. Finally manages to make enough water. Yay. Okay, then those bastards at JPL <laughs> landed the Curiosity rover on Mars. It went, scoop, hey, there's a shitload of ice in this. <laughs> there is an enormous amount of water in Martian soil. Um, every cubic meter of Martian soil has about 35 liters of water in it, which means if you filled up a refrigerator with Martian soil, and then, like, that's about two cubic meters, right? And then, like, extracted all the water, you'd have, like, 35 two-liter bottles full of water. So Mark didn't have to do all that stuff. He just needed to heat up some dirt. <laughs> but I learned that since then. And what I like to do is I like to say this. This is what I like to say. I just kind of retcon it a little bit. I say, like, well, uh, Curiosity is a gale crater uh, at the base of Mount Sharp, which is on the other side of the planet from where Mark was. Mark is in Acidalia Planitia, which is a desert. And so I say that just like Earth has different areas of rainfall and, and water distribution and so on, so too does Mars, or so I claim. <laughs> and so, until someone sends a probe to Acidalia Planitia, I'm still not technically wrong. I feel like you're the Mars expert until NASA says otherwise. And yes, that's, that's right. I, I make bold right. claims until disproven. I think that's appropriate. But, but it, it actually... Oh, I'm sorry, one other thing. Those bastards at JPL... <laughs> When they were choosing the landing site for Curiosity, they had this big long list of things, and it was very public, their decision, their process for narrowing it down. And they finally got down to like the final four. They had four different sites on Mars, one of which was Gale Crater, which they eventually selected. But one of the other of the final four was Marth Vallis, which is the, the valley that Mark drove through on his way to Scaparelli Crater. This all happened after I wrote the book. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Is Mark going to have to go around some piece of technology that can easily communicate with Earth? And it's like, ugh. But fortunately, they chose the other side of the planet, so that's good. That was very kind of them. Yes. Well, I called him up. I said, look, I know you want Marth Vallis, but... Help me out, buddy. Help me out. Come on. I, but when I was reading that, I kind of love that because this is a unique genre, I think. It's not only sci-fi, but hard sci-fi, right? Where unfortunately, I wish it was less unique. <laughs> yeah, so the cool thing is I, I have my own little market niche, right? After I wrote The Martian and after it got popular, I thought like, oh, this is cool. Now a bunch of people will see that that, that sells, and then we'll get a bunch more hard sci-fi, and then I'll be able to read it because that's what I like to read. And that didn't really happen. There's a couple. There's a couple of uh, authors who cranked out some hard sci-fi, but not many. And then I'm like, well, crap. I, I mean, the good news is I kind of own that little market segment, so it's good for me, I guess. But well, okay. not great for my entertainment value. Right. I have a couple of questions about that. Because, I mean, first is not so much a question just as, like, I'd love to hear what you think about the fact that this is a unique genre in that you're communicating with a developing world and a developing set of real-world facts, and we're learning new stuff about the moon, and, I mean, we know a lot about the moon, but we're learning new stuff about Still Mars Still learning new stuff about the moon all the time. Yeah, so you're, you're in a genre where something like we can say, okay, some parts of the Martian, if you were to today, would be different. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take away from the Martian. It's kind of cool, I think. Sure, I'll go with that. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's going to be invalidated by science. There's going to be more stuff. I mean, then... then <laughs> The Martian was so stupidly popular that, so the people who run Mars Global Surveyor redirected it to take pictures of Mark Watney's landing site. And they're like, well, this isn't anything like he described it. <laughs> I'm like, screw you. <laughs> Rude. Rude. <laughs> no one trolls, but it was all in no fun. No one trolls like a scientist. I guess not, yeah. But, but um, that was another question I had for you was that um, what do you think it is about hard science fiction? And just in case no one here is familiar with what we're talking about, hard sci-fi is... It's a type of pornographic sci-fi. Goat porn. It's goat porn. Um, it's, <laughs> goat porn. Uh, 
it's um, it's about it's based in science and facts, and it's a lot about like, well, how would this really happen? Yeah, it's an attempt. Uh, hard sci-fi in general means you're making science fiction, but you're trying not to violate any rules of physics, and you're trying to stay as close to existing technology as possible. Like all the, uh, not all, but most of the tech. I keep pointing to this like it's The Martian. It's not, <laughs> but all. Almost all of the technology in The Martian is real and exists today. Yes, there you are, for those of you who brought it. Um, and actually, Artemis is even more um, realistic, even though it takes place further in the future than The Martian. So. Yeah, and, and soft sci-fi is more like, uh, I don't know, the movie. Star Wars. Yeah, Star Wars, the movie Looper. I mean, technically, Star Wars is a, a space opera. So yes, you can well, get it Star so Wars is a fantasy. That. Yes, exactly. It has wizards and sword fights, okay? And spaceships. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, no, it's, it's a fantasy, and there's nothing wrong with that. So, and so it's very different. So, w so what you're saying is that you had hoped with the Mar with the the popularity of The Martian that more people would take up the mantle of writing like books that have a lot of science in addition to narrative. Yes, for completely selfish reasons of that's what I like to read. Yeah. yeah. Well, what do you think it is about? I feel like, what do you think it is that's that's preventing people from trying to write that kind of thing? What do you think is still intimidating about? making a narrative with science? Uh, well, that, that's a really good question. Cause it's hard to answer, and I think a lot of it has to do with market forces. I think there's, I, I've got to assume there's other dorks out there trying to write hard sci-fi. There's a, um, a lot that wanted to read The Martian, obviously, Yeah, right? <laughs> Yeah, um, I think part of it is, um, first off, keeping to real physics really limits your plot options. Like, if you can make some magical MacGuffin device, then then you can really just roll with that and explore what you can do with it and stuff like that. If you're not allowed to violate physical laws at all, and if you're trying to stick to real science, then you're kind of almost not making science fiction. You're almost making a drama or a comedy or whatever that's like that. Um, the other thing is I feel like, and here's where the market forces come in, I feel like uh, science fiction has really been kind of hijacked by dystopian young adult stuff. And like... I, it, it always seems to be the same. It's always like, oh, okay, of course, technology will inevitably lead us to a miserable fascist future where only a group of teenagers doing weird shit can save the day. <laughs> and I don't, I don't like dystopia. I mean, it's just, okay, so from a personal point of view, it's, it's just not a, a genre that I enjoy. Um, second off, I have... I'm a bit of a Pollyanna. I have a pretty high opinion of humanity and human nature, and I think the future is almost always better than the past, and I think we've got about 5,000 years of human history to, to back that up. I mean, in the short term, it can be crappy. Like, I'd rather live in, say, 1925 than 1945. You know, I'd rather not be in World War II. But, like, I would definitely rather live in 2025 than 1925. And you'd probably rather live in 1925 than 1825, and so on. Humanity always keeps getting better. We keep always getting better. The future is almost always better than the past, in the long term. Here, here's my question related to that, because I, I would agree with you, um, though I've read a bunch of dystopia in my day, and there's, there's interesting elements to it. Well, but I'm sorry to interrupt. No. I'm not that sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, dystopia also is... It lends itself very easily. It provides you with the conflict without having to do a lot of work. You're like, you don't have to do a lot of exposition. You don't have to explain. It's like, look, fascist government. Okay, got it. They're the bad guys. Okay, you know, uh, you know, disempowered, disenfranchised, you know, people who are impoverished and treated like crap. Got it. Those are the good guys. Those are the ones who have no power. They're trying to fight for them. You, you don't have to. You don't have to get the reader emotionally on your side. You, it's, it's immediately understood. Yeah, it's, bu it's built in in that yeah. way when you, yeah. Sorry, yeah, I well, well, my question is about, um, uh, I love, that is an optimistic viewpoint, your viewpoint of where we're moving forward, the arc of progress, all that stuff um, is, is real, but my other question is, you've also, in interviews I read, called Elon Musk overly optimistic. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of like, okay, so in sci-fi, right, there's like, say, Star Trek, the original series, creates the automatically opening doors. And then they are made, and now we all enjoy them. Um, but there's a lot of evidence of, I think, sci science fiction writers live a lot in like what's possible. And some of what's possible is bad, super bad. But in books, it, it shows up, and it seems like people in Silicon Valley are like, hey, that's a great idea. Let's make a software that can sound like anybody's voice. So we can make it sound like anyone saying anything. And it's like, huh, what? So bad. No, we don't want that. So there, to me, I'm, I'm so interested in, in what's optimistic and what's 
realistic. It seems like both sides have, it's either too dour or too like, technology can only be good. <laughs> well, <clears throat> on the too dour side, you have every episode of Black Mirror, right? <laughs> Except for uh, Junipero, what's that other one? That was great. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but um, in general, I think, and here's the other thing I do, is I, I challenge people, try to think of a technology that, on the whole, across all of the time it's been around, try to think of a technology that's done more harm than good. In, I'll get back to you. Twitter? <laughs> 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 Right. Sure. Facebook. But it's like, but no, I mean, it ha I mean, people are annoyed at, at aspects of it, but people get a lot of enjoyment out of those platforms. And also, it's like not a lot of people have died from that. I was expecting more things like, okay, nuclear bombs, right? But with them came nuclear power, which is, you know, do you like not breathing coal? Because... Dynamite. Yeah. Sure, but I would argue that dynamite has been used for a lot more good than harm overall. I mean, all the mining, all that stuff like that. I mean, so it's actually hard, and, and this goes back to my Pollyanna attitude about um, human nature. On the whole, no matter what it is, people tend to use things for good. So yeah, if you make a disintegrating ray, you're gonna have, there's gonna be a few people getting disintegrated. But then other people are gonna use it to dig tunnels and <laughs> stuff like that. You will have the occasional disintegration murder. That's true. <laughs> we just have to go with it. There, was, there is something, I think all the time about how often I hand my credit card over to waiters and how few times my identity gets stolen. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually a pretty good average, so that's a... People, on average, the typical person, and I think this comes all the way down to our lizard brain, I think it's just, maybe not lizard, that's a little too far back in evolutionarily, but our primate brain is like we are inherently cooperative. That's one of our main things. Being, being a really, really intelligent monkey doesn't help you if you're not working with other really intelligent monkeys, you know? Well, I like that. All right, well, we're not solving um, world peace today. That's not our job. Solving so. world peace. We must eliminate that world <laughs> peace. <laughs> we're gonna solve Ray. the problem of peace <laughs> breaking out. I do, I wanna talk to, though, about how The Martian could be influencing, like, I saw that there's a classroom edition of The Martian. Yes. Which is so cool. Um, and not only did they take out some of the swears, which they did, um, unfortunately, but... Oh, all of them. <laughs> all of them or not all of them? Well, all of them, yeah. yeah I mean, they're, they're all, uh, in the classroom edition, all of the swear words are replaced with, like, PG alternatives. Mm -hmm. And I did the, I was the one who made the changes. You chose them? Yeah. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> they sent me, um... They sent me a copy of the manuscript, just a printout of the manuscript, with every swear word highlighted. And the copy editor who did that said it was the most fun she's ever had. She's like, her job was just to highlight profanities. Yay! Shit! Fuck! Shit! Son of a bitch! Shit. It's also... It's also the kind of thing where you're like, I did have an editor tell me like, um, you can't say shit so much. And I was like, what? I didn't say it that much. And then she was like, I highlighted it for you. And I was like, Yeah, Ooh. well, my editor right there, he <laughs> sent me, he said uh, what, the first draft of The Martian, they, you know, because we went through editing, you know, once, once Crown bought it and went through editing and stuff like that. And he said like, well, you're kind of heavy on swearing. You have like, you know, it was something like, you have 217 fucks, 114 shits, and <laughs> just like, because it's easy, you can just search and yeah. count, you know? Yeah. You're like, oh, that's okay. Uh, I'm a writer. <laughs> but I'm a writer. Exactly. The, um, the, the classroom edition includes discussion questions and activities. I think it's so cool, and I think it's also cool to have that direct example of like your work possibly inspiring young people to go into math, science, and physics. Yeah, well, the classroom edition came around because I, I started getting a lot of emails from teachers saying like, hey, I wish I, mean, this is, I wish I could use this in my classroom, but there's so much profanity. And so eventually we did make the classroom edition, so that was pretty cool. And I, 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 didn't have, uh, I didn't write the discussion questions or anything, but now I get a lot of email from people saying like, oh, I use your book in my classes, the classroom edition. A lot of teachers had just said like, yeah, I use the normal edition. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, how does it feel to think that people could read your book and then be inspired to go into like the practical application of the science that you were so invested in? Well, I think, I mean, it's awesome and you like to think that you help, you know, people 
you know, kind of find their interests, but I don't think anybody's gonna read a book and that's gonna define their life. But if somebody, if it helps somebody realize that they are predisposed toward this sort of thing, you know what I mean? It's not like, oh, you know, I wrote a book that's so awesome, that's why you're an astrophysicist. No, it's this, but it, it makes a kid realize that they like that, then that's pretty cool. Yeah, and I mean, I think it's, it's um, like, it seems like space, space which is so so just like unquestionably cool unquestionably it's just awesome but so awesome. we seem to have lost a little bit of the romance for it that was present even a couple de decades ago for some reason so i feel like ha like having a kid be able to see like this adventure story that in involves space and being like yeah i can be involved in an adventure story through math and science like that's real well my generation our generation well you're probably younger than me my generation um <laughs> we never had and, and beyond never had an apollo moment like so my parents generation baby boomers they got to watch people land on the moon and walk around and that's amazing my generation, it's like, okay, the space shuttle was kind of cool, ISS is up there doing stuff, but there's no amazing moment. There's nothing like, I will never forget where I was the day I, that, you know, people landed on the moon. If you ask anyone who was alive and older, that, you know, old enough to be conscious, it they can tell. Awesome. What's that? It was awesome. It was yeah. awesome. <laughs> yeah. I, I, know, I know one guy, my, my, my friend from Spain, he, uh, he was telling me, you know, he, he was old enough that he, he was something like, he was like 10 years old at the time and he was watching it in, in Spain. And his grandmother just thought it was like a TV show. And she's like, why are we watching this? He's like, this is people landing on the moon. She's like, no, it's just a TV show. He's like, no, these, this is happening. There are actually human beings on the real moon right now. She's like, no, there aren't. She like literally never believed it. <laughs> Maybe she's where all the moon landing conspiracies I was came say, from. She, she was she was the first one. She's the cause. Oh my yeah. God, that's so funny. Um, <laughs> so, so I want to talk about um, a little bit about the time period between the Martian and Artemis before we kind of jump into to Artemis. Um, because your, not only was your career path entirely changed by the Martian, but your bit. life was changed yep. by it. And then all of a sudden you have this experience of moving into more traditional publishing where you have to like sell the book and then write it and there's deadlines and it's a little bit less You have to deal fun. with asshole editors. You got <laughs> <laughs> your poor editor. <laughs> no, um, yeah, no, it changed dramatically, of course. Um, the Martian sold really well. It got on the bestseller list and everything like that. Um, rumblings of the movie were starting to be taken pretty seriously. And I was still working as an engineer because like I said, I liked it. And even, even after it was clear that like, the, the, the money from the book was gonna be enough to support my life style, um, I still kept my engineering job just because I liked it and I didn't wanna leave the team in the middle of a release cycle. You know, I mean, for, I don't know, are any of you software engineers here? Yeah, a couple. Leaving your, you, unless you are really mad at the company, you would never leave during, you know, between releases because it's like, it's like, even if you disagree with the war you're fighting, you're not gonna leave the guys in the trench, right? You, so, anyway, so I, I stayed on longer than I needed to. Uh, but yeah, then it, then it changed my life quite a bit because then it was like, okay, I, I turned right around and got another uh, contract for a book, and I spent actually like a year writing a book, not Artemis, writing a book that was, uh, working title was Jack, and it was soft sci-fi. It had aliens, faster than light travel, telepathy, all this stuff like that. And after working on it for almost a year, I was about 70,000 words in, and for reference, The Martian is about 100,000 words. About 70,000 words in, I was looking at it, and I'm like, oh dear, this sucks. And it, and it, uh, I was like, I don't know what to do to fix this. I don't, I don't know what to do. So I sheepishly called up the, um, him and said like, <laughs> hey, uh, how about I throw this away and write a completely new book and you give me another year on my deadline? And he said, sure, because he'd been reading it too. <laughs> there was more to it than that, but that's pretty much what happened. And then so I, that's when I got started on Artemis. But that was, that was heart-wrenching to like put so much effort into a story that I thought was just the shit. I, I thought, oh, this is so awesome. These concepts are awesome. They're unique. They're, they're inventive. They're just really, really cool. But they just didn't make a good story. And yeah. maybe, maybe another writer could have done it, but it was just too epic in scale. The, 
So Well, and I do have a question about, well, let, let me ask that now, actually, because we're talking about the scale. You've mentioned in another interview that for uh, uh, Jack, is it? Yeah, um, Jack, yeah. That you made your own physics? I did have to make some physics, how yeah. Does, how does that work? Well, I mean, you make stuff up and then say it's true. <laughs> I mean, so basically, Jack has faster than light travel, which isn't possible. And so I had to come up with a system by which it was possible. And so I, that's what I, you know, that's what I had to do. Okay. <laughs> I have to say, I was reading it and I was like, dang, if there was just a made up physics, maybe I would have done better in physics. <laughs> I didn't take to the real stuff very well. Yeah, well, they say. don't, yeah, that doesn't really work well in exams, stuff like, it. yeah. Um, but I thought that was such a cool thing. But, uh, but the other question I have about this year that you spent, like, this is so common. When people have a, a book um, blow up and become a really big deal, there's so much pressure on the second thing. I mean, yeah. this happens in all forms of art. Um, and then you've, you've been pretty open about the fact that you have anxiety. And, yep. and I wonder if uh, before The Martian became what it is, if writing was a form of... Uh, like maintain or uh, um, managing your anxiety or, or coping with it? Um, you know, I'm not sure. I, 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 I don't know. Um, my anxiety is, it, it was always just like always worrying about everything that could possibly go wrong, um, stuff like that. So maybe it was, maybe it aided me in writing The Martian in that like everything goes everything wrong. Everything goes wrong. <laughs> right. Um, but I don't, I don't think it was therapeutic for me to do that writing. Um, I think actually a lot of it was just because I was uh, I had I had moved to Boston and I was living there and I had no friends I didn't know anybody and I had no life so it was like I had nothing better to do having absolutely no life friend friends or relationships uh, really helps you as a writer <laughs> It focuses the mind. It focuses the mind, <laughs> yeah. But, but I was like thinking about that year that you said, because it is hard to, to spin your wheels on something and realize finally that it's not working and you kind of just have to cut your losses and not worry about it. But I was wondering if that was you, how your relationship to writing may have changed. Well, I mean, yeah, it's like you have your whole life to write your first book and then a year to write your second one. Um, and yeah, no, it was terrifying because, of course, you know, was it... Uh, Give a man a book, you entertain him for a night. Teach a man to write, you give him a crippling uh, anxiety for life. <laughs> and self-doubt. Too uh, true. Yeah. And, and so I, uh, I, yeah, of course, I was worried. And also, just being realistic, when I was writing... So, Jack, I, I felt terrible about most of the time I was writing it. Artemis, I felt pretty good about as it was coming along. I felt like, okay, this is cohesive. I like the story. I like the characters and so on. But I got to the, I, you know... I still was thinking, like, there's just no way I'm going to have a hit like The Martian again, like, right off the bat, or pro probably ever. Probably, like, you know, I could write 50 more books, and then my obituary will be like, the guy who wrote The Martian died, you know? <laughs> so. Yeah, we can't control those zeitgeisty things. Right? Yeah, right. Uh, and um, so, yeah, so I had to just kind of, like, say, like, look, what I'm trying to do here is just... I, I want people to enjoy the book. That's it. It doesn't have to beat The Martian because I probably am not going to do that. But um, it, 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 it does have to be good. And has to pull you through and, and, and hopefully I've done that. Yeah, well, I like that. I was at, and I think it's important to talk about the times when things don't work out, the yeah. same as we talk about the things that do work out. So especially if anyone here is a, um, a writer, I think it's always nice to hear people say, something didn't work. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, also, you know, I mean, The Martian was the third book I've written. I wrote, rather, past tense. I'm a writer. <laughs> um, so I've written kind of a total of like five books, if you count the portion of Jack that I wrote, and only two of them. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but that's, that's a pretty common story for, yeah, for professional writers. So, um, so let's talk about Artemis. So you, uh, I love the story of how Artemis came to be. You're writing this sort of soft sci-fi, but I've heard you talk about how in the back of my, your mind you're I thinking was, about moon colonies. Yes, <laughs> right. I was, I was cheating on Jack was Artemis. Um, well, yeah, it, it, it kind of came from the same place that The Martian came from where I was thinking about the technology. And so I was like... I was like, I, you know, I want a moon city. And so before I even get into the science behind a moon city, I need an explanation for why there's a moon city. Like, what, why build a city on the moon? I mean, it's awesome. Okay, but, but that's not enough. You know, it's like, why would you do it? And I'm like, 
most of the science fiction explanations for why there are cities on the moon fall a bit short for me. They're like, oh, we, there's something cool on the moon that we want to mine. I'm like, well, first off, every, literally everything that's on the moon is also on Earth. Uh, but you could say, okay, helium-3 or something like that. Fine, send robots. Nobody cares if robots die. People care if Uncle Bob dies, right? And then number two, it's like people will be like, oh, okay. Well, people moved there because the Earth was like overpopulated. I'm like, really? Did you colonize the ocean? Did you colonize the Sahara, Antarctica? Because all of those are a lot easier to colonize than the moon, right? And then other things will people be like, oh, well, it's, it's like pilgrims. It's like people left to keep from being oppressed. They left an oppressive central government. I'm like, if you can afford to build a city on the moon, you're not the oppressed. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so um, what I came up with was tourism. And I, I decided it just takes place in a future where the price to low Earth orbit has been driven down low enough that middle class people can afford sort of a once in a lifetime trip into space. And I've got some economics to back it up and I wrote an article for Business Insider about it. I read that. So, so if, you, if you care enough about that. So yeah, that's another thing. It's like I'm also an economics dork <laughs> and it is really hard to make economics exciting. So I just kind of like, I, I came up with all the economic underpinnings of Artemis, but then I tried not to go too deeply into it. Because if we've learned anything from The Phantom Menace, it's don't start a story with a description of supply-side economics. Yeah. But, yeah. Move away from the Galactic Senate. We yes. don't need yeah. to know. Um, but uh, anyway, so I said, okay, it's a tourism industry. And from that, I built it out. I said, like, okay, well, then what they're going to want is, like, hotels and casinos and, you know, brothels, whorehouses, whatever, all the things that tourists like in the international waters kind of world. And also, what would tourists want to see on the moon? The Apollo 11 landing site. That's the obvious thing you'd want to see. So that right there told me, well, Artemis has to be near the Apollo 11 landing site. The moon's big. If you're 2,000 kilometers away, from, you, you can't get there. So it had to be close, but not too close because you don't want to damage the site with all the construction. So there's a visitor's center and a train. And so it just started to come together like that. Then I got to work on the technology, which for me is the really fun part. You know, um, If you pick up rocks off of the surface of the moon, 85% um, of those rocks, if you, there's an 85% chance that you just picked up a piece of anorthite. Anorthite is made of aluminum, silicon, calcium, and oxygen. If you run it through a smelter, just like you know, smelting on Earth, you get those individual elements. So the, you use the aluminum to build your base, your city, and then the oxygen to fill it. It's like the moon is made of just moon bases with some assembly required. It's, and you can't make this stuff up. This is just true. If I invented a fake planet that had these properties, people would say, you're just making it too convenient. But it's not. And then dealing with the radiation problems, dealing with making sure that you, there can't be a catastrophic pressure loss, dealing with all these things. That was fun. And then I had to come up with like characters and plot. Yeah. <laughs> well, and speaking of that, before we get to, into too many more specifics, do you mind doing the, the quick pitch for Artemis so we can talk about sure. it? Sure. Uh, Artemis, as you've already gleaned, takes place in a city on the moon. Uh, the main character is a woman who's a small-time criminal, um, and she gets in way over her head. That's the uh, elevator pitch. It's a good one. And, and I just thought it was so interesting that the Martian started because you created, in your mind, you were thinking of practical problems and problem solving. And it sounds like that's a, kind of similar to what drove Artemis. Kind of. I mean, like, I mean, I, I had a lot of fun creating the city and all that stuff like that. But the plot and the story of Artemis revolves around, it's a crime novel. Uh, it's a crime story. Uh, yeah, the main character is Jazz. She's a... Uh, like a kind of a petty criminal, mostly does smuggling, and like a rich guy hires her to do some industrial sabotage, and everything goes fine, there's no complications, and the book ends. <laughs> no, obviously all sorts of stuff goes wrong, and, and things just keep getting worse and worse. <laughs> yeah, and, and I mean, before she even, I mean, like, I, there's, so, there's so much that goes wrong, and <laughs> she's so calm about it, I was reading it like, holy cow. Uh, she's not she, exactly calm. Well, that's true. That's <laughs> she's true. a little bit panicked but a lot. She handles it, and it's <laughs> like it's it's so fun to. Um, I think Mark and Jazz are sort of similar in that they're like survivors in that way. But but I I was thinking about this because it's hard sci-fi, so it's very realistic. So you're 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 telling a story in that way, but. But it is also, you know, a lot of science fiction deals with like human nature or talking about what we, why do we do these things? You know, what's, what's the nature of human progress? And I think 
this is a story of survival. Both the Martian and Artemis are stories of survival where the main characters are surviving. And I was like, why? But they're surviving with, with grace and with, with self-respect. You know, they're, they're very proud. And they are also doing it with humor. So I just would love to hear you, hear you talk about what, what's of interest to you about these stories of survival in space. What, why is that so interesting? I don't know. I mean, well, so The Martian was just a straight up, like you said, person versus nature. And that's really interesting to me because every, every problem was a scientific problem and every solution was a scientific solution. And so I got to go back and forth and do all that. It's a series of like 10th grade math problems, really, is The Martian. Um, Artemis, well, I wanted it to be, I, I wanted to be more a human story. Like, it's really about people interacting and, um, and a little bit of underworld stuff. And it's kind of the Wild West out there. There's not a lot of law. And um, so I guess, I, I mean, I don't see Jazz's story as being one of, like, survival. I mean, it becomes one of desperate survival when people are actively trying to kill her. But she also brought that on herself, right? Jazz is a much more... Um, I, so after The Martian, like, everybody liked The Martian, or almost everybody did, but no one would accuse it of being literature, right? It's like, at the end of the book, Mark is the same as he is at the beginning. He undergoes no change. <laughs> you don't really know anything about him other than he doesn't want to die, which you can generally assume about most people. And so he, he really didn't have any depth. He was a funny guy, a likable character. It was not a character-driven story, and so everybody would forgive that. But I wanted to kind of try to stretch myself as a writer, so I tried to make a much more complicated character. Jazz is complicated. She has a backstory. She's got some bitterness to her, a lot of regrets in her life, and she makes bad decisions sometimes, and like morally bad decisions. And most of the problems she faces are of her own doing. She's a very flawed person. So like, what I like to say is that Mark is really based on me. Mark is the idealized version of me. It's like the parts of my personality that I like and none of my many flaws, whereas jazz is a lot more like the real me. <laughs> People like Mark more. <laughs> I th that's such a cool way to approach character, though. You know, I, I, I love that. I think, every, I think every main character is... Well, the, the saying that I used to say is every, every main character is somebody the author wants to be or someone the author wants to screw. I think that's true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, you also said that writing this book was hard because... Well, I, there's two different ways that I want to ask this question. You've said that it was hard because your audience was different right off the bat. As in when you were writing The Martian, it was serial, and so you were getting <coughs> feedback, and you mentioned having the 3,000 you know, newsletter subscribers. That's so, that's so cool, because it was like an intimate readership base, you know, and that's a relationship you had with your And readers. feedback every chapter, yeah. which is nice. It encouraged me, it really, it really helped motivate me, you know, I'd get like, you know, when I'd post a chapter, I knew that like that day, I'd get a couple of hundred emails of people saying, hey, this is great, oh, I like this, or hey, you suck. But, you know, there's always one or two of those. But, you know, it, 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 it really helped motivate me, knowing that I'd get the sweet, sweet validation that I yeah. crave. Um, but, yeah, and then writing Artemis, I was just by myself, you know. It's hard. Yeah. How did you stay motivated? Um, well, I had a contract. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd also, I also felt, well, I've got a certain professionalism to me, I think. I, I've got a work ethic, and I felt really bad because, like, the publisher had, like, I spent something like 10 months working on Jack only to press the big red reset button, which they let me do. But then I was like, okay, I really, I, I've used up all my kind of like brownie points. I, I want to really come through on this one. I actually finished it like a, a little bit early on the deadline. Not a lot, like, nice. like a week. <laughs> Still. But I wanted to get it in there, yeah. That's, and, that, and, and the other thing about it was that you said that your early readers for The Martian were so useful in fact-checking. Yes, and of course I couldn't do that for Artemis. Uh, publishers don't like it when they give you a big pile of money as an advance and then you give away the book for free. So um, I didn't have uh, that kind of like audience to do that. So what I did was I tried to be, I, I was just a lot more thorough on my research because it wasn't as casual as, as it was with The Martian. With The Martian I could be wrong, someone would point it out, I'd go fix it. With this I had to be right the first time. So I was much more careful and there are still mistakes in there but so far, so far, the only real like significant mistake I've found in there is um, there was just a, a very simple math error on combinatorics when it comes into she's trying to 
she's trying to figure out the code to a safe and it, she knows it's a four digit code and she knows what three numbers they are but she doesn't know what order they are. So she knows there's three numbers that make a four digit code, so one of them's repeated obviously. And she was like, oh, well then there's gonna be this many possibilities. But the number is wrong. Like I got, the, I got that number wrong. It doesn't have any effect on the plot or anything, but it is a math error. <laughs> <laughs> and how, how were you informed of this? Oh, uh, you know, emails, <laughs> lots of them. And so like eventually like I, I now have like a, a stock response that I can copy and paste and say like, yes, you got me. I da, 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 da. Yes, you're very smart. You're Thank very you. clever. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, and that seems like a lot of pressure. Well, but then the other thing is that, you, like you said, there's we know more about the moon. So you almost had more to go on anyway? Or? Yeah, I mean, it's true that we know more about the moon, but it's, it's, easy, it's easy to get that stuff right. I mean, it, 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 science is not likely to discover anything that is going to invalidate the core science of Artemis. Like, they're not going to say, like, oh, it turns out it really is made out of cheese. And no, oh, it's, it's the, like... The moon, the moon landing was fake. Oh. The moon landing was fake. Oh, well. Grandmother in Spain turned us on to this yes. reality. Um, yeah, it was filmed by Stanley Kubrick, the moon family. But he was a very exacting director and he insisted on shooting on location. So. <laughs> well, that's now my headcanon for that. Um, okay, we are going to do audience questions. I do Before we get to audience questions, my last thing is just about where, where you want to go next because I've heard you say that Artemis might ha be like a world that you want to populate. I definitely want to spend more time in Artemis. I want to write more books that take place in Artemis. But right now, I haven't got like a really solid uh, idea for what to do. I've got, I've got some ideas, but none of them are fleshed out enough. And so my next book, I'm actually kind of torn between two different ideas. And I'm e e so torn that I wrote chapter one of each of them. Oh, wow. And so I'm still kind of deliberating, waiting for some feedback from that guy um, on, which, on what he likes more and so on. So we're kind of in the process of choosing what my next book will be. Okay. And then I'll get to cranking on that. I feel like the next time I see a 3,000 word article on Business Insider from you, I'll know what your next book is yeah, going to be, be about could economics. Be. <laughs> But I definitely do want to, I want to return, I want Artemis to be a series. Yeah. Well, that, that's exciting to me. I'm excited about that. Um, okay. So we have, um, we're going to take maybe like five or six audience questions. Um, we have one already in the front. We have people, sure. I think, walking around with microphones that we're going to yes. help us possibly. Yes. Um, so we'll take the front row question and then we'll get to the rest of the crowd. Yeah, Batman there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, a, a gentleman I work with just walked in and described you know, the basic premise of, uh, you know, The Martian and I was hooked. And he's an old school project manager and really liked how you step through every problem methodically. You just, you hit his wheelhouse. So I was very yes. happy to read it. What I'm curious about is, you know, since that is uh, hard science fiction and that's what you like, what did you grow up on? What would, what, who did you read? Yeah, well, I grew up, interestingly, I, like, even though I'm, you know, a, a Gen Xer, I grew up reading my dad's science fiction collection. So he had this bookshelf that was just jam-packed full of every paperback he's ever owned. I still don't think he's ever thrown away a book. And, like, so I grew up reading, like, Asimov and Heinlein and Clark back in an era that where they wrote, it really was hard science fiction, although a lot of that stuff has been invalidated by what we now know and so on. But it was, like, you know, chemical rockets going around, it just these adventures in space. And they had that optimistic view of the future future of like, oh, technology's awesome, man. I mean, yeah, these characters have problems because of this thing, but it's not, it's not the world that is a problem. It's like these people are in a leaky spaceship or something. So yeah, that's my holy trinity. Yeah. We have more question? How about right in the front right here? Float. Um, a lot of authors have like a ritual that they follow when they're writing to stay focused. First, I sacrifice a goat. <laughs> <laughs> Not that kind Same of ritual. Reason. Okay. Anyways, um, a lot of them like listen to like podcasts or music. Do you do any of that when you're writing to stay like on track? Um, no, I don't. I don't have any like specific ritual thing like that. I mean, I try to. I try to work, write a thousand words a day when I'm working on my first draft. And until I've made my words, that's my term. Um, I'm. I'm not allowed to do a bunch of things that I like. Like I'm not allowed to watch any form of video entertainment, like YouTube or television or anything like that. Certain monumental time wasting websites, I'm not allowed to go to. I really love woodworking, so I'm not allowed to woodwork until I've. You know, stuff like that. 
so, you know, I basically deny myself my hobbies until I've, like, finished my words for the day. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Does that, so that does that, excuse me, does that mean that you wake up and get right to it in the morning? Uh, usually no. Um, usually I do goof off a bit, but then once I get into it, then um, basically, I, generally I do most of my writing after lunch. So, get up. I, I'm slow to rise. <laughs> it's a good, a good hop, habit to get into. Okay, we got two in the front here, so we'll do a, the black shirt and then the green shirt. Um, I haven't seen The Martian, the movie yet, but what I was struck with was reading, in reading the book was how the voice of him was so Matt Damon. It was, it <laughs> really, really was. Um, were you happy with, with oh, his yes. casting and the way the movie turned out? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, they, they, they did such a fantastic job. I mean, they really, um, they really stuck to the beats of the book, too. I mean, it was a very loyal adaptation. And Matt nailed the role. I mean, he just absolutely did fantastic. Hi there. I'm a big fan of your work. Hi. I just wanted to ask, in retrospect, given what the bastards at JPL have done to your science... Bunch of bastards. If you could, would you have written something else, like the Uranian, maybe? No. Um, no, I would have incorporated what the bastards came up with, right? I would have had more realism. Um, also, if I had it to do over again, I have since learned uh, that, that Mars has lightning. So I would, have had, I would have found a way to make a lightning strike be what starts the sequence of events that strands him there. Like a lightning strike something that maybe sets off some sort of explosion somehow. I feel bad for this, this poor lady here who's been like, we, yeah. have, we have carefully gone around and oh, picked no. everyone but her as she keeps raising her hand. <laughs> Hi. Um, while Jazz was ignoring high school, because clearly she was, yeah. um, was she missing the pages on Mark Watney in her high school history book? <laughs> <laughs> So you're asking if uh, The Martian and Artemis take place in the same universe? Uh, I'm leaving that open. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not answering that question for a variety of reasons. One of them being I, I don't want to necessarily tie them together if I don't have to. Another one being all sorts of contractual clauses get activated if I say they are. <laughs> that is wise. That is wise. I think we have, we have one right here in the middle. I think we have time for a couple more. So, Hi. A uh, big fan from New Zealand here. Hi. Uh, yeah, first book I ever read was A Princess of Mars. Uh, so uh, I knew the margin, which was seen quite well. But my question was, um, I was writing, trying to write sort of high, uh, hard science, and I found that using, you know, physics and stuff, the dialogue becomes so boring. Is that what you were talking about earlier? Well, I mean, so the way I dealt with it was... Basically, the problem is, if you're going to have science play a pivotal role in your story, it means you need the reader to understand the science, which means one way or another, you need to exposition it to them. And so that can get really dull. But I have also found that readers will forgive literally anything if it makes them laugh. So pirate ninjas, yes. So all of Mark's, I also picked the epistolary format, you know, like log book entries which allows me to just cheat all the rules of literature. I can have the character talking directly to the reader. And I could just have them crack jokes. And so if I make you laugh every few paragraphs, you don't mind reading about, you know, weather patterns on Mars or other stuff that would be really boring. That, that, that was the, the, biggest, the, the biggest thing, is that that information had to get across in a way that didn't put the, the, the reader to sleep. And that has the added benefit of making him, it, it really humanizes him. Yeah. Uh, having him have a sense of humor is another way of saying a point of view. Mm. So then you get to know Mark a lot by what makes him mad or yeah. <laughs> what he wonders about Aquaman. How about him? He's been waiting a while. You. This. Yeah. And, and, and this will be the last question. Aww. Thank you so much. How did you go, um, I mean, you skipped a lot of the problem because gunk doesn't take much cooking, but how did you go about researching low pressure cooking? Low pressure cooking. Um, well, first off, they have pressure cookers, um, so that's easy. Uh, but the other thing is, um, there's yeah, there's a bunch of problems. Well, it actually is what, do in the book. Do you want to explain what gunk is first? Oh well, gunk gunk itself is just chlorella um, algae, which is just this uh, oceanic algae that's natural. The cool thing about it is, if you adjust the frequencies of light that are hitting it while it grows, it'll 
change how much of its energy goes into making proteins versus how much goes into making sugars. And so by giving it the correct frequencies of light, you can make chlorella grow to be perfect, um, perfect nutritional balance for humans. And this is what they eat on Artemis. Uh, well, Artemis. this is what, it's what poor people eat on Artemis because you can grow it there. You know, as opposed to having to import food. Um, in terms of cooking, usually what they just do is add flavorant to gunk and maybe heat it up. I mean, so they don't, they don't, there's not a lot of cooking. Although in the book, there is a section that talks about how bad the coffee is in Artemis because the boiling point of water at, Ar Artemis's atmospheric pressure is about one fifth of what it is on Earth and, and it's 100% oxygen, which is the same partial pressure of oxygen that humans need. There was also um, the bartender trying to recreate yes, <laughs> scotch. Yes, there was a bartender trying to recreate scotch, but that has nothing to do with low pressure. But the... Uh, well, hang on. Um, so the coffee is bad because the hottest that... Because uh, wa water boils at 61 degrees Celsius, like, which is like 150 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the hottest water can be in Artemis before it boils. Um, as for the um, alcohol... Um, the vapor pressure of if you just put like ethanol in a fifth of an atmosphere it won't it won't automatically boil off I, I might be wrong but I don't think so um, anyway the bartender tries to de-ethanolize and dehydrate scotch have the sludge shipped up and then re-ethanolize and rehydrate it to make delicious scotch which did not work <laughs> yeah I think You're Jazz's comment that, like, is that yeah it's actually pretty crude what she says <laughs> but <laughs> Well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for questions, but thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you, Thank Amy. you. Thank you.